Hello, listeners of Siouxland Catholic Radio, Channel 88.1 FM, KFHC Ponca Sioux City, and KOIA Storm Lake. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in and listening to this edition of Faith in Action. I'm your host, Joanne Fox, and I am ever so grateful for all of you listeners and supporters, and mostly for Mary's Choice, a pregnancy resource center here in Sioux City, Iowa, that is the supporter and underwriter of this program. Uh, They do wonderful things, and again, so grateful for their support. And uh, if for some reason you have to step away and because you can't listen to the entire program, I want to remind you that this will be a podcast, and that can be found on SiouxlandCatholicRadio.com, or you can go to Spotify, or I think we're on about a dozen other podcasting platforms So many opportunities for you to listen to Faith in Action. And again, thank you so much for your support. Well, as I've said in the past, this show is pretty much about me and my friends. And so that's who I have on the show today with me. I want to welcome Patty Lansink. She is superintendent of schools for the Diocese of Sioux City. And not all the schools, the Catholic schools. I better make that clear. So welcome to the studio, Patty. Thank you. It's good to see you. It is. It's great to see you, too. So why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, and and all that good stuff that they might not know about. Okay. Well, um, I grew up in Ida Grove, Iowa, and since life is a circle, I'm right back there living again. (laughs) Uh, So I commute every day. Um, I am married to my husband, Jason. We've been married for 26 years this year, I believe. Uh, we have three children, um, and they've all gone to OABCIG, um, that <laughs> alphabet school, we call it. Welcome to Consolidation in yes. Northwest Iowa. Yes. yes, unfortunately, we don't have a Catholic school in Ida Grove, Iowa, so uh, my kids went to the public school there. Um, but I, my education journey began, I was a science teacher in Wall Lake, Iowa, right out of college, and then um, I went back to school and got my counseling degree. So I was a school counselor for a while in Ida Grove. And then I went to Storm Lake for a while. And I went back to school again and got my principal's endorsement. And I um, got a call from Father Paul Kelly in Denison, Iowa, and he needed a principal for St. Rose of Lima School. And so I went and um, have loved every minute of my time in Catholic schools. It was my first experience with the Catholic school. i I went to public school, obviously living in Ida Grove, um, and it's been an absolute blessing. So then I was at St. Rose for seven years and yet again went back to school. Uh, (laughs) Dan Dan Ryan encouraged me to get my superintendent's licensure, and uh, so I did that, and then little did I know he planned on leaving me. Uh, Yes. Um, And so I was assistant superintendent with Dan for a few years, and then I took over the superintendency, I think it was in 2017 now. So I've been doing this for about five years already. I know. Time flies. It does when you're having fun, especially. Yeah. So the listeners may not be aware of the Catholic schools in the Diocese of Sioux City. Yes, listeners, we do have people that, you know, are in the Archdiocese of Omaha, and we do have (laughs) St. Michael's... uh, Catholic school folk on every once in a while. And of course, we also have listeners up in the Diocese of Sioux Falls. But today we're going to focus on the Diocese of Sioux City. So, Patty, if you would tell the listeners um, the the systems of our Catholic schools in the diocese. You bet. So we have 16 of them that cover the 24 counties in northwest Iowa. Uh, we've got Bishop Garrigan up in Algona. We have Spalding Catholic School in Alton. Um, Sacred Heart School in Boone, Iowa, Kemper Catholic in Carroll, Danbury Catholic School in Danbury, Iowa, Uh, St. Rose of Lima, as I mentioned before, is in Denison, Emmitsburg Catholic School, Uh, St. Edmund's up in Fort Dodge, St. Mary's in Humboldt, Uh, Galen Catholic up in Lamar's, just north of here, Pocahontas Catholic School, St. Mary's in Remsen, Uh, We've got St. Pat's up in Sheldon, the Bishop Helan system here in Sioux City, Sacred Heart in Spencer, Iowa, and then another St. Mary's in Storm Lake. So I believe that's 16. I believe that is. I ran out of fingers, but I think we hit all 16. (laughs) Yes. And because we have a majority of our listeners in Sioux City and we talk about the Bishop Helan system, we have sites for the grade schools and the middle schools. 
And I kind of remember those sites, even though my kids are long out of school. So those sites include what? which ones? So we have three K-8s, um, and some of those, one of those K-8s is Sacred Heart, and they're all under one roof. It's actually PK, preschool through eighth grade. Um, and then we have Holy Cross, which is St. Michael's and Blessed Sacrament together. Uh, and then we have Modern Day, which is Immaculate Conception and... Um, Oh, goodness. Nativity. Nativity, thank you. Yes. Yep. And then we have the high school. Right. So those are really the four four main sites, I guess you would say. Okay. And so now um, we're into the school year. Uh, tell the listeners about enrollment, because that's always an interesting thing that we talk about. It is. Um, we take our official enrollment counts on October 1st, usually. Uh, right now, our estimates are that we're up about 3%, and we have about 5,800 students. Okay, so, that is up. Yeah, we, we like to be up. So 3%, we'll take it. Absolutely. Is there one school that seemed to have a greater number uh, influx of students than a previous year, maybe? That is a great question. I think um, at le- St. Mary's up in Humboldt has okay. had some growth. Um, you know, we, all, we had a, quite a few schools have a little bit of growth. Um, Spencer grew. Um, Storm Lake St. Mary's was up. You know, 4%. Uh, here, Bishop Helam was up about 4%. Pocahontas was up. Um, Lamar's was up. So, yeah, we, we had some pockets that were up, mm-hmm. up a pretty fair number. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it was good. It is. And, of course, it kind of begs the question, what do you think people are looking for in a school when uh, they are enrolling their child in a Catholic school? Because certainly – we know that we give a pretty good education in the state of Iowa to our, our children. Mm-hmm. So what do they tell you, or what are the principals or the staff telling you that parents are saying, you know, I think this is a better fit for my child than perhaps a public school? Sure. I, you know, of course, we, we wish every parent would say, I'm choosing you because of your faith uh, <laughs> component. Uh, we don't find that that's always the answer. It is for some. Uh, some like us because we're safe. Um, some like us because we're small, smaller class sizes, and that's what they're looking for for their student. Um, yeah, every, it seems like everyone's got a little bit different, different reason, but I would say those are the three main themes, the faith, um, the safety, and then smaller class sizes for their kids. And it's interesting that you mentioned the faith because in a number of our schools, in fact, I'm, I believe in every single one of our schools, you can probably find people who are not Catholic. Absolutely. We have a few of our schools are substantially, um, probably 50% of their kids are non-Catholic. We have a couple of those. So, wow. yeah. yeah. So that speaks volumes again, that they're looking for the trifecta is mm-hmm. what I would call it. Yeah. And then the other thing I think that's fairly interesting, and, and I don't think anybody would disagree with me, is that Northwest Iowa has a pretty substantial Hispanic Latino community. Absolutely. And I think that is probably reflected in our schools as well. For sure. In fact, when I left St. Rose of Lima as principal there, I think we were up to 75 or 80 percent of our students were Latino at the time. Um, There's a substantial population in Storm Lake, uh, Sheldon as well. Um, I think Bishop Helan is working to reach out to that population of students here in the city. Um, so, yeah, we, and we've had several schools go through um, what's called the Latino Enrollment Initiative. Yes. That's a program put on by Notre Dame University. And uh, schools will go out and do a, like a four-day um, workshop in the summer on how to be more welcoming and just educating them about the culture um, so that's been really helpful in helping them reach out to their students and families and, and be a more welcoming environment. And what other kinds of good things might be going on in our schools? And especially as we prepare for Catholic Schools Week, you know, sure. that is the time that we can really celebrate yeah. what's going on in our schools. So yeah. maybe some other initiatives that are, are interesting. So this year we are working on our next round of strategic planning um, Our last strategic plan took us through 2021 for my office, and then our school's plans took them through 2022. Uh, So given the the COVID piece, we we got behind in reviewing our plans and planning for the next round. So we are currently in the middle of uh, drafting our goals and strategies for our next round. Um, So we'll be working through that in the springtime with all the local schools. They'll be writing their own strategic plans, and those will carry us forward for the next five years. 
So they'll have goals uh, around Catholic identity, around academics, um, operational vitality with enrollment and finance, and um, I, oh, leadership and governance as well. Okay. So that's that's it's very time consuming, but it's a really worthwhile project. It really just guides everything that our schools will do over the next five years. So it's been it's been a good process. And in that process, I think it's kind of interesting because you obviously are gathering input from the educators, maybe from parents, maybe from pastors, maybe from the community. And how do you then put together a plan that works for a district as large as Sioux City? And I think one of our smaller ones would might be um, Spalding or maybe mm-hmm. Remsen. Again, I can't remember figures exactly, but those are the schools that seem to be a little bit smaller. So how do you then work through that? Because what might work really, really well here in Sioux City might not work so well in, right. in, at Spalding in Alton. So. Right. So we craft a plan first for my office to mm-hmm. help, you know, help me think through how I'm going to lead schools over the next five years in general. Some of those goals and strategies we'll ask schools to include in their local plans. Um, and then we really let them tailor theirs for what works best for them and their locations. We do extensive data gathering. Um, we've used the Meitler company to help us with that data gathering piece. And so school, we'll lead schools in looking at their data and seeing you know, what goals and strategies fit. You know, One goal might be to increase enrollment. Well, if your town is decreasing in population, that's a really tough thing to do. Um, so maybe we need to look more at right sizing, you know, right sizing your staff for the number of students that you have um, and think about how to do things differently in a smaller school. So, OK, so listeners, as you know, we usually take a short break and give a shout out to our supporters and our underwriters and maybe do some public service announcements. But uh, that's what we're going to do right now. I want to remind you this show is Faith in Action. I'm your host, Joanne Fox, and I ask you to please stay tuned because we will be right back. Hello again, listeners of Channel 88.1 FM, KFHC Ponca Sioux City, and KOIA Storm Lake. Uh, If you've been with us from the top of the hour, you know this show is Faith in Action, and I'm your host, Joanne Fox. And I am talking with my uh, good buddy, Patty Lansink, who is the superintendent of the Catholic Schools for the Diocese of Sioux City. And it's really gratifying to hear that we are seeing good stuff going on, that enrollment is up in a number of the schools, and uh, to revel in that enrollment and other good things, uh, nationally, there is Catholic Schools Week, and that is typically the end of January and goes into February, and so there's always a theme, and I think the theme is the same this year, but what is that theme, Patty? Uh, you know, Joanne, you're putting me on the spot. I, it's like <laughs> faith, hope, and Charity? service or something <laughs> like that, yeah, but it has been the same for the last three years, I think. They've used the same logo and, and uh, themes. So, okay. Yeah. And so what would you say the purpose of this celebration is? I would say the purpose is to raise awareness uh, of all of our Catholic schools and celebrate the good things that they're doing, um, celebrate our faith, obviously. Um, and we've honestly started to encourage our schools to do their registration for the following year about that time. So then they can coordinate maybe an open house event um, and get new folks who are interested in the door and get them registered for the next school year already. So we we start really early looking. It seems like life's a circle, right? We just keep, Mm -hmm. you're almost not even done Mm -hmm. January. We're not half done with the current school year Mm -hmm. and we're looking to the next already. So, And that makes sense Mm -hmm. because that is a time where um, a lot of times the teachers will do special things with the students so they can display them. So to have the open house registration, it also gives, I would think, your office an idea of the trend in enrollment again. You know, mm-hmm. what do we need to do in case we're not seeing students coming back or we're seeing more students? Because then, of course, that's a great thing. But then, you know, how do we adapt? And you mentioned um, the open house. And I know uh, several, uh, and especially in... Um, some of these more vibrant communities, the schools will partner with their chamber of commerce and they will have like a chamber coffee and they bring in people. And it's really a great way to show the community the good stuff that is going on. 
and they're very innovative. And of course, you were at St. Rose of Lima for a goodly amount of time, and mm-hmm. you were probably the person who was coordinating with your teachers and students and staff how we best do an event or events because it's a whole week uh, to celebrate our Catholic schools. So maybe there's some innovative stuff that you could share with the listeners besides a chamber coffee, which is always fun because, well, it's coffee yeah. and it's pastries. Yeah. And who doesn't like donuts? So. Exactly. But there's some other fun stuff too. Yeah. Um, you know, when we had a saying at St. Rose, I used to say it was like homecoming on steroids, Catholic <laughs> schools week at St. Rose. We literally had something going on every day of the week. Um, It was a really busy week, and teachers are exhausted at the end of it, um, but it's really good stuff. And so, as you mentioned, the chamber is one way, but they really do reach out and thank their communities because their communities really do help support the Catholic schools uh, with donations and various things. But we also want our kids to get out and give back as well. So we try to come up with other ways that they can serve their communities um, so one thing that we did, we did lunch with the law one year. We had the police officers come to lunch, um, and that was a great day. They went out for recess with the kids afterwards. Um, one year we took uh, treats to the fire station, um, the police department, and took a big thank you poster to them signed by all the kids. So just, you know, ways to reach out to people in the community and say thank you and um, give back. So. And I know one of the things the students really enjoy doing, and I remember this, that the Spencer Sacred Heart kids would just kind of walk across the the playground and go to the nursing home, which is right there. And, of course, the residents just love it because these kids are all full of energy. And I think in the past, Rems and St. Mary's might have done that with Happy Siesta, too. Um, That seems to resonate in my head. And, of course, listeners, if you pay attention to this show, you know, I spent a great deal of my life in the field of journalism covering these events. But I love it that you say it's like homecoming on steroids because – Typically, what I remember is there were dress-up days, yep. you know, dress-up like the 60s, which I still have close, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because that was my time frame, yep. or, you know, something else. And I, I think even those little things, you know, mean a lot to building up that sense of community in a school is, oh, look, we're all doing this together, and we're having a lot of fun. Yeah, that's one common theme whenever you talk to anyone who has their kids in a Catholic school or who works in a Catholic school, it really, everybody is like a family, um, no matter who you talk to. They, they have formed this little family um, in their Catholic school, and it's, it's really great to, when you're part of it. So Yeah, and I think the community appreciates it too, and you mentioned that. Um, many times, um, that's a good amount of employment in Absolutely. a community, mm-hmm. and you kind of talked about, you know, the, the alphabet schools, um, you know, you said... Um, uh, Ida Grove, and I can't remember all the other ones. Um, that, O-A-B-C-I-G, oh, O-A-B-C-I-G, Odebolt Arthur, Odebolt Creek, Arthur. Ida Grove. <laughs> yeah, Odebolt Arthur. And uh, and the other one I remember is uh, Marcus Merritt and Cleghorn um, Remsen yeah. Union. <laughs> yeah. Phew, it's yeah, a lot. It and that's hard. That's much harder to build up a sense of community, I think, primarily because the schools are coming together with their own identities, and now they're forming a new identity. Yeah, it takes a while. It does. Mm -hmm. It does. And that was one of the, I think, excellent things that happened between the Lamars and Spalding folk Mm -hmm. is when that dynamic changed and much went into how do we build up this sense of community. And it wasn't just an overnight thing, but it seems to have translated very well that the schools are are doing well. Yeah, it really has. In fact, I was also principal at Spalding last year. I don't know if you knew that. I did not know that. Um, we yes, is I that helped. other duties as assigned? It was other duties as assigned, and you know, honestly, it was my favorite day of the week because I just really miss being in schools and around mm-hmm. kids and teachers. Um, so yeah, I was up at it's, and it works really, really well. I they've just kind of formed this seamless transition. So. When kids are done in sixth grade at Spalding, most of them will go on to Galen, and there's a bus that goes every day and gets kids there and back, so it's worked out really well. And again, it speaks to the commitment of the parents For sure. that they want this, and you know, it doesn't matter if you're Catholic or non-Catholic, they want this. They want this education for their child. And, of course, part of being the Catholic school is there's mass. And so um, one thing we discovered, we had vacation Bible school here, and we had some non-Catholics that participated in it. And then we had kids who didn't go to Catholic school, kids that went to Catholic schools, kids that were homeschooled. 
But we were so surprised at the response we got because we had Mass every day. And we thought, hey, you know what, maybe one day we'll recite the rosary. Maybe one day we'll have a service, like a scripture service. Mm -hmm. But the parents were saying to us that that was so meaningful that we had Father Peter Wynn come in and celebrate Mass for these kids. And sometimes I think we take that for granted that... And, and again, what does it allow? It allows the priest to be visible to the kids, yeah. you know, in kind of a different way. And that intimacy instead of maybe mass where he's up there on the altar and then maybe after mass he's got to go see folk. Um, so I think that's a great thing as well. And why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about when they do mass, that it's not just adults that are leading that we've got readers who are the students and oh, yeah. things like that. Yeah, when they do school masses, um, usually the kids are doing the readings. Uh, the kids are doing, they're bringing up the gifts. Uh, they might be ushering. Uh, the kids are really, really involved in the mass and the planning of it. Um, and, you know, teachers as well. So sometimes the teachers will do the lecturing or they might do the Eucharistic minister. So, yeah, it's uh, it's a team effort for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And there's nothing sweeter and more innocent and more heartfelt than seeing an eight or nine year old get up there and stand on a little step stool, which sometimes I have to find a step stool as well, (laughs) because I'm shrinking as I age. And to hear them recite sacred scripture. Yeah, there's there's nothing like it. It truly is just beautiful. And then I'm going to give you a heads up, listeners. We are taping this a tad early. So right now, um, Bishop Walker Nicholas will be going to the schools. As you know, I I clarify that because he has submitted his resignation (laughs) to the Holy Father. And so we are in this transition period uh, because he turned 75 of waiting for a new bishop. So we are taping this a bit early. Um, But right now, as we tape... Uh, Bishop Nicholas is going to visit the schools. This is typical during Catholic Schools Week. And then he celebrates Mass, and then he kind of hangs around for selfies and lunch, and he has a great time. So those alternate every year so he can get to all of our schools. So which schools will Bishop Nicholas be visiting this year? So right now we're planning on visiting Bishop Garrigan and maybe Humboldt in the same day since they're so close in proximity um, Storm Lake St. Mary's is on our list this year, Fort Dodge, St. Edmund, and then Carol Kemper is what we're looking at this year. Okay. So, yeah, you know, the COVID years kind of threw off our schedule a little bit, so now we're trying to catch up, and it's it's been a while since we've been to some of those schools. So. And he racks up those miles on his vehicle. He does. <laughs> yes, he does, because that's no short trip to go clear up to Algona. He's such a trooper, and he's so good. You know, when he gets in the classrooms and talks with kids, he's so good. He's so good at connecting with them, and uh, they just love having him there. So Yeah, and as I mentioned, we are taping this a bit early. One never knows the Holy Spirit works in mysterious ways. We might have another bishop or he would be then the ordinary of the Diocese of Sioux City. Bishop Nicholas always gets to be bishop of mm-hmm. the Diocese of Sioux City, but whoever replaces him then will be the next ordinary of the Diocese of Sioux City. And if we got that uh, that individual, then we will. Uh, he will be on the road too. Time will tell. <laughs> Time will tell. So like I said, we're taping this a bit early before Catholic Schools Week, so uh, we shall see. And. Well, I guess that means it's time to take another very short break. And uh, I ask that you stay tuned, listeners, because we will be right back. Hello again, listeners of Channel 88.1 FM, KFHC Ponca Sioux City and KOIA Storm Lake. This show is Faith in Action. I'm your host, Joanne Fox. If you've been with us for the top of the hour, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your support, as I do the support of Mary's Choice, a pregnancy resource center here in Sioux City um, that supports us as our underwriter for this show. And if you're just joining us, well, welcome. And uh, you can always go to our website to hear this entire show, SiouxlandCatholicRadio.com, and you click on my picture, 
or uh, we are on a dozen other podcasting platforms like Spotify. So we offer many opportunities for you to hear the show, and, and I'm hoping that you're enjoying it. So thank you again for your support. So in the studio with me is Patty Lansing. She is the superintendent of the Catholic schools for the Diocese of Sioux City, and we've talked a lot about the wonderful things that are going on, enrollments up, Catholic Schools Week is coming up, but anything that is worth doing comes with some challenges. And, of course, if anybody reads the newspapers or, or follows any kind of media, it's kind of everywhere. So staffing mm -hmm. has become quite the challenge. Uh, I'm sorry, but COVID really has wreaked havoc on so many things, and teachers probably at the top because they were the ones – that had to adapt so dramatically to the classroom, the hybrid, the Zooming. Oh, Lord, you know, talk about challenges. Those are them. So now we're kind of into a school year. Patty, why don't you tell the listeners about some of the challenges, staffing probably being a number one. It is number one, absolutely. Um, you know, I think COVID had parts you know, a, a part in it. Um, but we're also finding there are fewer students going into teacher prep programs. Um, one statistic I heard recently was 30% fewer oh. students actually going into college to be a teacher. Uh, so there are lots of challenges out there. And uh, I'm hoping that, you know, our state department of education can step up and, and start helping lead us in how to address these challenges. Uh, some of the things that we've had to do locally in our schools, we've had to hire staff, um, substitute teachers mm. to staff a classroom, um, you know, full time because we can't find a full time teacher. You know, we used to have 20 some applicants for an elementary position. And now we're lucky if we have two or three. Wow. Um, so it's really scary out there. Um, my my poor principals have really been struggling mm. to, to fill their classroom positions. Um, so that's a huge challenge. And. We, in fact, we just met with a legislator down in Carroll a couple of weeks ago. He, was, he wanted to hear more about the challenges of staffing and how they were affecting schools directly. So, so it was good to, have, to know that somebody is listening at the legislative level, and, and hopefully they'll think of ways to help us with that. Absolutely. Yeah. When we talk about that statistic of, you know, 30%, it, that, it's just, it just takes my breath That's away. That's a big percent. What have you heard that might deter someone from wanting to go into the field of education? How has that changed? You know, Joanne, that's a really great question. I, I, from an educator's perspective, I feel like a lot of, you know, it's really hard to be a teacher, harder than it's ever been to be a teacher these days. Mm -hmm. We have students coming to us with a lot of needs. Um, you know, there's a lot of social emotional fallout, I think, even from COVID and just uh, kind of our society these days. So, Teachers end up being counselors and parents as well as trying to teach their kids that they have in their classrooms. Um, and we just keep getting more and more piled on us. So, you know, we, it seems like they're asking teachers in classrooms to do more and schools to do more every year. Uh, you know, now we have to teach computer science in our classrooms. And so th they keep adding more to our plate, but nothing ever gets taken off. <laughs> so it's just really challenging to be an educator these days. And I, I'm not sure that it's a, as attractive a career as it used to be. Sure. When I was uh, teaching, and that would have been at the college level at Western Iowa Tech Community College, I often joked that I was not only the teacher, I was their mother and many times their counselor. And not very often, but maybe once or twice, the bouncer. Yeah. You know? yep. Okay, we got a discipline problem, and you're an adult, and you need to leave now. Thank you. Yep. But it was much easier with those were adults. Those were 18-year-olds, you know, up to I even had, you know, people older than me. And they had a better sense of classroom decorum than a six- or seven-year-old. Right. So I think that that probably is uh, a huge challenge is then how do you, as the instructor, become all these people? And, yeah. Yeah, there's a, a really large focus on social and emotional health right now in schools for students uh, and even for staff. You know, they have a lot that they have to deal with as well. So there's a large focus. I think it'll start to help if we can be proactive in addressing those needs and, and figure out how to help kids and, and staff deal with them. 
Yeah, and we were talking about uh, the teachers, but the staffing issues of the staff, a secretary, uh, the kitchen the, helper, the mm-hmm. lunch lady. <laughs> yep. to, uh, but you know who who doesn't want to be a lunch lady? Um, but your support staff, your principals, uh, you know, all of the other folk that are associated. Um, and all you got to do is drive down a street and your fast food places, you know, $2,500 signing on bonus. You know, they'll pay you $15 an hour to do something at a fast food place. And so I imagine it's the same thing at our schools is how do we get not just the teachers, but these people that we call the administrative staff. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's difficult to pay them is what, you know, like you, you mentioned those wages. It's really hard to compete with those yeah. wages when you're paying part-time staff in your school uh, as a classroom associate or somebody who's going to help out in the kitchen. It's, it's really hard to compete with today's market. Yeah. So I think, you know, kind of um, what the push should be is the value, that there is value in you being associated. And I think that number one value that you mentioned earlier in this uh, exchange, family. Family and faith. Yep. Family and faith, those two wonderful things. Absolutely. And then um, I know this is kind of interesting because I kind of follow this, is we had so much trouble <laughs> with the supply chain issues. So, you know, getting supplies to the school so you order them, and we've all had this experience. Oh, I see this wonderful thing on Amazon, and I click on it, and and it's six weeks, eight weeks. Um, we tried to get a washer and dryer, and the lady said, well, probably two months, you know. And I said, well, I'll just take that one right there. It's sitting there. Can I buy it? She said, yeah. She said, I don't have any others in stock. So that kind of thing also, and that would probably weigh on your your principles is, oh, my gosh, you know, did all the orange juice come in or did all the buns come in? Or am I kind of off base on that? I feel like things have settled in that respect. Um, there might be some things that are, you know, we um, with this round of federal funding from COVID, it's called EANS funds. It's emergency assistance to non-public schools. Uh, So a good share of our schools were able to participate in that. So they're still trying to spend those funds. It's pretty limited in what they can spend them on. But one of those pieces is technology for remote learning. Well, that's probably been the largest struggle to be able to get, you know, computers and devices because everybody's scrambling for the same, the same products. Yeah, and that is so critical now because I see it everywhere that that you need those yep. items, you yep. know, to to become more savvy with our uh, ever changing technology. Yes, and then of course you need training then as it exactly. changes. Yep. So, what kind of um, support do you provide for training for staff and for for teachers to to help them. And it isn't just the, you know, here's how to turn on the VCR. Oh, did I just date myself? (laughs) It only would have been worse if I would have have, said the overhead projector. (laughs) Listeners, trust me, I was mocked (laughs) when I taught. I loved my overhead projector and my my clear um, overhead lays. Oh, my gosh, I love them. But, you know, how do then the schools address that as well? In addition to, you know, the support that they need as far as some of the emotional and, and psychological and other things that are going on with these kids. So how do, how do the Catholic schools kind of address those issues? You know, our Catholic schools really tailor their professional development plans for their staff based on what their needs are. Because as you mentioned before, you've seen one Catholic school, you've seen one Catholic school. They're all a little different <laughs> and have different needs. So they do tailor their professional development accordingly. Um, you know, when we started in, uh, after the COVID um, pandemic had started, that summer we worked with a company to offer online learning sessions for teachers on how to teach online. Um, so I think that was helpful to get everybody ready for fall because that was always our intent is that we're, you know, we're going back in the fall. If the governor lets us do it, we're going. Um, and you know, some public schools weren't able to do that, but our, all of our Catholic schools were able to open that August. So that's one example of when we did it as kind of a diocesan approach. Uh, but really our schools now are tailoring their PD for what their teachers need. Uh, As I mentioned before, a lot of it's focusing on social and emotional health. Um, we have a lot of schools doing things with restorative practices right now. Um, and then they're also, you know, literacy and math. That's always our focus is, is academics and, 
helping um, our students learn better. So, and there are standards that have to be met, benchmarks, sure. yes. you know, and that is um, certainly some of the things that your office provides. But you are a school, and so the state. And the nation, I believe, but well, probably more the state, I would We're guess. We're all accredited by the state of Iowa. So we do, um, you know, adhere to those standards. Mm-hmm. We have diocesan standards, but they are aligned to the state of Iowa standards as well. So Okay. And yeah. just one more thing to try and uh, deal with. Check off know. the list. Check yep. off the list. Yep. So listeners, one more time, we're going to take a short break. And I, I do ask you to stay tuned because we've got a lot more to talk about with uh, schools here in the Diocese of Sioux City. So I'm Joanne Fox. This show is Faith in Action. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hello, listeners. You're listening to KFHC Ponca Sioux City and KOIA Storm Lake, channel 88.1 FM. Or you may be listening on SiouxlandCatholicRadio.com. Or maybe you're listening on one of our 12 podcasting platforms, Spotify being the A number one. And again, thank you so much. This show is Faith in Action. I'm your host, Joanne Fox. And thank you if you've been with us from the top of the hour, the half hour, or into this is the last um, quarter of the show. And we are grateful for your support. So I'm here in the studio with my good friend, Patty Lansink, who is the uh, superintendent for the Catholic schools of the Diocese of Sioux City. And what a wonderful load of information that you've shared with the listeners. And the last segment, we talked at length about the challenges. And I would be remiss if I didn't ask about how our schools are safe environments. And there's a couple of ways to kind of uh, define safe. Mm-hmm. So, Patty, why don't you tell the listeners about how things have changed in our schools to make sure they are safe environments. Sure. Well, sh- you know, shortly after the Newtown tragedy years ago, we enacted a policy where all of our school buildings have to be locked during the school day. Um, so that happened almost immediately. And I think that that immediately changed all of our schools just to, um, you know, ensure that no random people are just walking into our buildings. Um, and so that's, that's one thing that's happened. Since then, every school now has an emergency operations plan in place. Again, that was a state requirement, but since we're state accredited, all of our schools followed suit, um, and those are reviewed annually. Um, and then they're all doing annual trainings and drills with their staff. Uh, in fact, Helan just had Chad Sheehan come in and do a training called Save Yourself at the start of the school year this fall. It was really, really great training. Um, so teachers and staff are trained on what to do. Um, you know, you, you can never plan for every yeah. um, happening, but at least they have the basics, and, and I think they're better prepared to react if something would happen. Um, and we, in fact, the governor recently announced the safety grants for, the state, for schools mm-hmm. in the state of Iowa. Yes. And so our schools are taking advantage of those as well. Um, it's quite a process. They have to go through... A, an application process. They have to apply for the grant. They have to have an audit. So a company will come in and audit their buildings and look for where they might beef up their safety and security. Um, so that's, that's an ongoing piece that we just started. Um, but yeah, you know, they're definitely, they look different than they did 10 years ago for sure. Yeah, absolutely. In a good way. Yeah, and this mm-hmm. is good because we want our children safe, want them learning, but we want them safe. Yes. And anytime you pick up the newspaper or turn on the TV, you know that there are times when that does not happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing that seems to be a trend right now is when I use the word safe, it's the environment among the students as well. Mm-hmm. And um, certainly the Sioux City Community School District has talked a lot about the bullying aspect and how they are addressing it. Um, what kinds of things do you see in our schools? Um, you know, because kids are kids. And so how do then the principals, the teachers, the staff address what they might think are what I would call bullying? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, as you said, uh, kids are kids. I couldn't put it any better. And our kids in our Catholic schools are just like the kids in the public schools. Um, Sometimes they're mean to each other, and sometimes they don't always make good choices. And so we do have a bullying and harassment policy for the Diocese of Sioux City Catholic Schools. Um, And if something like that happens, that's that's our protocol, and our schools follow it. And um, we we address it just like 
any other school would. So Okay. Yeah. The other thing I um, noticed is uh, because the Sioux City Community School District, and we are obviously in Sioux City, that's where our studio is, has implemented a cell phone policy. So maybe you could tell the listeners a little bit about how our schools handle cell phones because that's everywhere. And in fact, um, I was uh, when I interviewed Dr. Ray Garendi, he asked me, what do you think is the average age for a child, you know, now having a smartphone? I guess 10. He said nine. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would guess 10 as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's. I, I guess on one hand, unsettling, I understand where parents are coming from with it, but maybe tell the listeners a little bit about how our schools handle cell phones, because we have high schools. Yes, we have seven high schools, which is sort it, it's kind of unusual for a diocese to have that many high schools. Um, you know, Des Moines, they've got two, basically. It's Dowling and, and St. Albert's and Council Bluffs. So we have seven, and really everyone handles this locally. Again, it's kind of what's going to work best in their community with their parents and their mm-hmm. families. Um, so I can share a few examples. So Kemper, um, they have all of their students put their cell phones in, um, they have like those shoe organizers right inside the door of the classroom. Yeah. So when kids walk in the door, they have to put their cell phones in the shoe organizer and they don't have them during class time. Um, I think here in Helan, I think the kids have to keep them in their lockers. So it just depends on the school. They all handle a little bit differently. Um, cause you know, for me to exhibit or to, put a, a blanket policy yeah. in, in force for seven different places. Uh, it, it, I think they appreciate the local control there and do what's best for their own kids. Yep. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. But of course, um, a lot of our listeners are grandparents and so they barely know how to use a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I, I get it, you know, that they want to know that their, their child is, is being kept safe and you know, that there's, there's control mm-hmm. because that's a big part of the school is you're kind of the, the parent for the day that the the child is with you yep so we're looking to the future now yeah hopes and dreams for the future oh superintendent gosh joanne (laughs) you know i hope we get a wonderful bishop i mean obviously (laughs) that's at the top of my list um again we don't know the timeline um but i'm sure gonna miss our current one um he's he's just been wonderful to work with he's so supportive of me and of our catholic schools it's just been a blessing to work with him so i i'm i'm Hopeful for a wonderful bishop. Um, I'm really hoping that we can find a way to address the staffing shortage because it's it's probably the hardest thing that our administrators have to deal with. Um, it's it's really tough out there, and so I, I hope that we can find a way to address that staffing shortage um, along with our our state leadership. Those are the two things that I can think of right now. It would be always good if we could get a little boost in enrollment. Of course. We always want to boost in enrollment. Um, But as I said before, you know, sometimes we just need to right size. And, you know, sometimes I think folks have this, if you don't have X number of students in your building, oh, my gosh, that school is going to close. And that's not always the case. You know, we can serve students. uh, We can serve a population of 50 kids if we have the right staff in place and serve them differently. And I think, you know, one thing that we're really working on currently with our administrative staff um, or administrators in our buildings is thinking about how to prepare our students to be future ready, um, to go out and get a job someday, uh, because, you know, the jobs that are going to be for them someday don't even exist today. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's hard to prepare for students for jobs that we don't really know exist right now. Um, but teaching them to be innovative thinkers and creative and those sorts of, and work together, collaborate with other kids. Um, and then also personalizing learning for kids um, instead of a one-size-fits-all approach, finding ways to really tailor education for what's right for, for each kid. So that's kind of the direction we're going, and it'll be exciting to see where it takes us. Yeah. A lot of times uh, parents worry about uh, obviously, Catholic schools have tuition, mm-hmm. and it would, I think, help, Patty, if you would talk about that that is not as big an obstacle as a parent might think. Absolutely. We have a diocesan scholarship program. Uh, we have lots of different scholarship programs within that to help folks afford a Catholic school education. Um, so we, we always tell families, do not let tuition be the obstacle parishes, um, schools will find a way to help you get a Catholic education for your student if that's what you want, if it's right for your kid. So um, 
Yeah. Yeah, and I, I guess if uh, someone's listening, especially grandparents, because mm-hmm. they like our show, I think, and they're thinking to themselves, you know, this might be a good fit, you know, for my granddaughter, grandson, um, niece, nephew, son, daughter, you know, to to go to a Catholic school. And we are getting ready for Catholic Schools Week, and so you mentioned, you know, a lot of them will have registrations, but what would you suggest or recommend if someone's listening and they're thinking this might be a good fit for my child? What should they do? Go visit the school. Um, I can't possibly stress that enough. It's like a college visit. The minute you step in the door, you'll feel it. Um, you will feel that family atmosphere and the friendliness and the welcoming environment. Um, so you need to go visit. And it's like I said, it's like a college visit. You'll either feel this might be the right fit or, you know, it's not for everybody, but um, we, we think we can welcome anybody. So I think so, too. So listeners, that kind of wraps up another edition of our show. I want to thank my guest, Patty Lansing, who is superintendent of the Catholic Schools of the Diocese of Sioux City. Always great to have you in the studio, Patty. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. It has been. So listeners, I remind you, this show is Faith in Action, and I'm your host, Joanne Fox. And um, I want to give a shout out again. Mary's Choice Pregnancy Resource Center here in Sioux City is the underwriter for this show and the sponsor. And I'm so grateful to them for their support. So um, if you've tuned in late, I want to remind you that you can listen to this show in a podcast. It is uh, located at SiouxlandCatholicRadio.com. And then you just click on my picture and Faith in Action and it will show all the shows in case you're interested in everything we've been doing here. Or you can also uh, find us on uh, at least a dozen podcasting platforms, including Spotify. And again, we are just so grateful for all of your support. So that uh, brings us to the end of another edition of our show. And uh, on behalf of myself and my executive producer, Ann Reed, I want to remind you that uh, I want to remind you that a faithful reaction is good, but faith in action is so much better. Thanks for listening, and God bless.